Egypt is still in, in flux, it's still in transition. The Muslim Brotherhood won the presidency, took over Egypt, and are actually doing a terrible job. And if you're not a fan of the Muslim Brotherhood, that is the best news you could possibly have. Uh, the president of Egypt is, is proving to be extremely unpopular, and the Muslim Brotherhood may be doing itself in, in Egypt, which is potentially very good news, again, if you're not a big fan of their agenda. Uh, Libya, generally, I think Libya is going to pull itself through and be fine. It has a tiny population. It is a big country. Almost everyone lives up here along the coast. It is covered in oil. If they can't get this one right, they have a, they have a real problem. Uh, Tunisia will be fine. It's a tiny government. It's a small country. It's got a beautiful coastline. It lives on French tourists. Uh, the people are very well educated. They've always been well educated. It's generally moderate. The problem in North Africa was and still is Egypt. And the danger is that Egypt could descend into chaos if the Muslim Brotherhood, which is proving to be unpopular, demands on staying in power, and then you have a, a conflict there. Uh, maybe there's a counter coup. Uh, that, it's still uh, very much in flux as this, this situation plays out between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military. And I think the military is very happy to see the Muslim Brotherhood failing and is allowing the Muslim Brotherhood to fail and to a degree even causing the Muslim Brotherhood to fail. Um, the question is, will the military step in and have a coup, which would probably be very unpopular, and, and I think the U.S. is probably right, recommending that the military not step in and have a coup, but to allow the Muslim Brotherhood to bury itself in the public opinion. So that's the situation just in these countries in North Africa. The more volatile, dangerous situation is there like earthquake in here or something like that? I've noticed the map is, uh, is, uh, is Don't worry this, about it, you've seen worse. Yes, is this, uh, this arc right in the center of the Middle East? So if this is North Africa, you know, this is the classic Middle East. And the, the problem right now is Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. And I think that is the, the biggest problem and it is a, an emerging problem. Syria is in state collapse. And the government is now, according to several governments, including our own, uh, has used small amounts of chemical weapons against the opposition. Uh, that came out today in the news, and I was working on that uh, tonight. Uh, the U.S. is couching how much was used and when, and is adding a lot of caveats. But the general consensus by the intelligence community is Syria has used very small amounts of, of chemical weapons, and the, the, the state is in collapse. And as it is in collapse, it is exporting conflict into Lebanon and re-exporting conflict in Iraq and refueling the civil war. And to a degree, the civil war that was in Iraq was one of the driving engines pushing the civil war in Syria. So you have three conflicts that are reinforcing each other. The old civil war of, that we all probably remember uh, from the 1980s in Lebanon the civil war that's been going on in Syria for the last two years, and the several year civil war, particularly 2006, seven, and eight in Iraq that is now starting up again. And I think over time, you're gonna see an emerging, almost single conflict going from Lebanon through Syria, through Iraq. So from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And that's a real problem. It's a big region. You could look at the strategic importance right next to Iran and Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Israel, of course. So this, this is uh, what I would be most worried about, this band of conflict. And it goes, but the center of it is, is in Syria. As this state implodes, it's reviving the other conflicts. And that would be the general overview. Uh, I think Israel is trying to avoid the storm. Uh, it is building a lot of defensive positions a lot of walls, a lot of fences, and is trying to lay low. Uh, Israel has had a period, you know, many periods of activity and inactivity in its history. Activity, let's say, 1948, 1973, 1967. I think it's right now is trying to let this activity settle. Activity wars. Wars. Right. Um, 
I think right now, uh, Israel is trying mostly to let this, let the dust settle and see how this plays out and is preferring to have the Middle East focus on its own problems, but is also concerned that if these eventually settle <coughs> out, maybe it will settle out in a way that is, uh, that doesn't line up in Israel's favor, but that's down the road. That's down the road a couple of steps. So I think in the, in the, in you mean in if the, the Muslim Brotherhood or the equivalent of the, if, well, if, if the, re if the Muslim Brotherhood were to suddenly <coughs> take over the Middle East, then yes, sure, that would be very bad for Israel. What but does that not, mean? What does that mean? Very bad. What happens in your opinion? Well, I don't. But here's the thing: it's not happening. The Muslim Brotherhood isn't taking over the entire region. What what it, what would it mean? I mean, this is a group that wants to destroy Israel. So suddenly, if it takes over the Middle East, would we they have, be in a position to destroy Israel? Militarily, um, no. Uh, but it would be very messy. Uh, you'd have lots of people bent on destruction, but that's not happening. Okay. And that's, that's the important thing. So w from Israel's perspective, the idea is to wait and let this settle. Because a year ago, or even two years ago, it looked like the Muslim Brotherhood was going to take over the M Middle East. And if had Israel acted then to counter that movement, it probably would have encouraged that, if anything. But it didn't. A and the Muslim Brotherhood is doing itself in, in Egypt. Um, Right now, there is this ongoing conflict in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and I think Israel wants to see how that plays out. Its most immediate concern would be that the, the chemical weapons that are in Syria right now get transferred to Hezbollah in Lebanon, and uh, that would be a, well, that would be a, there'd be a war that would start over that. Um, there hasn't been any evidence that that has really happened uh, thus far, or no evidence that it has happened thus far. Uh, but that's something to watch. Um, uh, any weapons transfers from Syria to Lebanon would be uh, uh, of major concern to Israel. Lebanon uh, doesn't want war to start again. There are many people in Lebanon who have no interest in this. Lebanon is divided into three communities. There's the Shiites uh, in the south who are dominated by Hezbollah, many of them not by choice. You have Christians in the middle and Sunnis in the north. And uh, if you ask them, Probably not a single one of them wants the civil war to start again. But if you have old, old grievances that are revi or revived and, and stirred up again, and you have state collapse next door, sometimes old wounds come back to haunt you. Uh, in Iraq, the, it's, a, it's a basic Sunni-Shi'i divide. Iraq for 1,400 years was a Sunni state. And the United States toppled it, imposed uh, democracy, which was, uh, has had mixed results, and it became a Shiite state. And the Sunnis never, forg never forgot or forgave that reversal of power. And now they're hoping that they can help the Syrians, who are just the opposite, by the way. Syrians, it's a Sunni majority with a Shiite minority. And they're hoping that if they can help the Syrians topple their government, then the Sunnis can come back and retake over Iraq. So to make it very simple, you have these three <coughs> conflicts, all one which was settled in Lebanon, that which could start up again, one which was never settled in Iraq, and one which is boiling in Syria, fueling each other. 